All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much to everyone for tuning in today to our Advancements in IoT webinar with AT&T Business and Arrow. I'm Brittany Nelson, Partnerships Manager at Indiegogo, and here with me today are Ray Burke, Don Johnson, and Jordan Alexander from AT&T Business. Just a quick note, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom, and we will try to address them at the end. All right, without further ado, Ray, why don't we get started? Um, thank you very much, Brittany. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today's presentation covering IoT Network Strategy 2020 and beyond and our thoughts um, for what we are seeing in AT&T from the carrier perspective on technology and evolution that we feel is relevant to the entrepreneurial community. So I hope you find the same from the presentation. I am Ray Burke. I'm a business development manager at AT&T and I'm working with Arrow and Indiegogo supporting the entrepreneurial community. Today, we'll spend some time on topics to support at building your product ideas into enterprise or consumer solutions. My colleagues, Don Johnson, will cover the IoT low power wide area network, what we're seeing and the network evolution in the low power wide area networks. And my colleague, Jordan Alexander, will take us through some slides around lightweight end-to-end -end device management and some considerations as you're working through product development with your products. If you could go to the next slide. And actually, why don't you just kind of, kind of, I just breeze through that. If you go to the next slide. You know, our, our thoughts here, we've experienced explosive growth in IoT connectivity to work in the machine-to-machine -machine space, all right? Um, we expect this growth to continue in the near term. Technology is evolving at a very fast pace, and your role as an entrepreneur requires making decisions around product development, platforms, service delivery, and where are you investing your resources and where are you placing your bets, right, to build products that will be receptive in the marketplace. This slide just highlights some areas where AT&T has placed bets developing solutions and seen a lot of success, right? There are, you know, these are highlighting areas in the industrial space. We've also seen explosive growth in the consumer space with um, personalized devices that people are wearing, with medical devices that people are, are connecting up through mobile connectivity. So there is a lot of growth and a lot of use cases underneath each of these areas that provide opportunities for the entrepreneurial community to develop products and fit, fill gaps as they're developing, right, in product offerings. You know, the next generation networks that are coming up in that evolution as we talk about um, 5G are gonna open up new opportunities and new use cases for products that we don't even know about yet that we're working to develop and we'll understand more as the technology enables it. If you could go to the next slide. You know, as an entrepreneur, your IoT ecosystem is important, right? And who you choose as your partners in your IoT ecosystem can help impact product development, you know, flexibility of offers and provide some guidance that can help you achieve your objectives. The program that's offered with Arrow and Indiegogo and AT&T provides a robust ecosystem to support your product development and bringing your vision to life. Um, AT&T is proud to be part of this Arrow Indiegogo partnership and to work with you on these projects and your endeavors. All right, from, from our perspective, you know, as a carrier, if you, you look at this slide, you can see, you know, these are areas that AT&T is focused. So our part of the ecosystem is helping you in the connectivity portion of it, how we can offer integrated solutions and, you know, driving innovation. I mean, these are areas AT&T has made bets on and focused heavily over the years. And we're proud to be able to share, you know, our knowledge and capabilities with you and your team. With that being said, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Don Johnson, 
to take us through low power wide area network advancements. Don? Cool, thanks Ray. Uh, good afternoon everybody. Again, my name is Armorning. My name is Don Johnson and I'm the product manager for AT&T's low power wide area networks. You go to the next slide. Um, so what I'll spend the next few minutes talking about are our low power networks, kind of talk about what they are, um, how they apply to you, what's the uh, optimal use case for these networks, why we deployed them, and then what are the benefits of these networks compared to some of the other networks that may be available for connectivity. Let's go to the next slide. If you think about connectivity, we really connect in several different ways. So most traditional in the wireless standpoint is the cellular um, 4G network. So think about your smartphones or your tablets. Those connect off of your basic 4G LTE network. In addition, we have a satellite connectivity or for very remote and rural locations. We have your old traditional wireline for you know plug-in wireline LAN networks. And these new networks, um, which are called low power wide area networks, which really fit a very unique use case and solve a lot of obstacles that come with connectivity for many different uh, for many different use cases and entrepreneurs. There are two main low power wide area networks that are cellular based. One is called the LTE category M or shorthand LTE M. And the other one is a narrow band IOT network. You go to the next slide, Alex. Let's talk a little bit about what these networks really mean. So low power networks are essentially what they, what they, what they are, describe what they do. So they are networks that emit less power and other wide area networks, which offers advantages as such as better coverage indoor and underground, longer battery life, and actually lower cost hardware, so lower cost modules and devices. And they're also cellular based. In this space, there are some other networks that you may be familiar with that play along with it. They're non-cellular, things like the LoRa based network, LoRa WAN, L-O-R-A, um, Sigfox, uh, even some of the mesh networks that are out there. These are all networks that offer these similar type um, benefits as far as um, lower power, longer battery, better coverage, those type things, but they're not cellular based. They're using an unlicensed technology, which can lead you open to some security risk or, um, or just a, a mismanagement of a network. These networks um, really are beneficial for some of these um, use cases. They don't really require a tremendous amount of bandwidth. So they sit on the lower bandwidth scale uh, but they offer a lot more advantages than, say, a typical network that you may have. We, we at AT&T have deployed both the LTM and narrowband IoT networks. If you look globally, there are some countries that have done just one network, and some have done both, and some of them are either, either or. Uh, there's, there's been initially there was some thought of like, well, will it be one versus the other? Well, we at AT&T determined that both these networks are very complementary to one another and that we deploy both of them to reach the widest scope and accomplish and cover the widest number of use cases. We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, again, this is a double click on what these advantages are. Uh, longer battery life, uh, up to 10 years or even longer in some situations, depending on the UK use case. Much lower cost hardware, so the actual modules that you use to create these, uh, these devices and solutions are lower cost, uh, they're smaller. They use license spectrum, so it's managed by a carrier network uh, with coverage across the domestic coverage, and we're talking about global a little bit, but coverage across the nation um, using a license spectrum that's managed by us or uh, eliminates uh, issues of interference, adopted by over 120 carriers worldwide, and basically it offers an out-of-the-box connectivity. Uh, if you think about it, even with like a Wi-Fi type, there has to be a step where the user has to make a, a pairing or some sort of configuration to connect to the network. Using a cellular-based network like these two, you're, you're basically connected immediately. And so there, it actually uh, helps eliminate one step from the user and can kind of give you even better usage of the solution that you're putting out there. You can roll the next slide. And so where does it fit on this scale of different networks? And so as I mentioned, these networks are really identified more for lower bandwidth, lower power use cases. These um, are things like sensors, things like monitors, things like um, asset tracking, things, even like some smart appliances. These are places that really, you don't really necessarily uh, use a tremendous amount of data, but you want to um, want to find something to connect. One of the reasons we actually deploy these networks is because we feel like it opens up many more use cases that previously were not there for cellular-based connectivity. And the reason I say that is because if you look at 
typical cellular connectivities with your mobiles, with remote healthcare, video security, going on to telematics and above, um, while they're perfect use cases, they, they can be quite expensive. Um, and they often, using that network, often um, seem to could be a bit overkill for some of these smaller use cases. So these networks were kind of put in place to give you solutions to meet these use cases. Um, you think about things you can do um, in the smart home with if you connect a connect your small appliance, you know, the dishwasher, those things are stationary. They're probably not going to connect that often, but you use um, a cellular based technology as opposed to maybe your Wi-Fi, you uh, get that extra benefit of the, of the user actually connecting to it without having to go into the, explaining them how to connect to their Wi-Fi, especially think about a home healthcare with some of those devices or even out in the field with the, with the, with the, with the sensor monitoring, right? It may be, you know, there may not be Wi-Fi out there, so you would need a, a cellular based technology to reach those those sensors are out in the field, out in the monitor, out in really hard to reach places. So effectively, as you scale up performance, mobility, you go with the kind of cat one up into 5G. And if you scale down to lower power, you go to a, a category LTM or narrow band IoT. If you can roll to the next slide for me. And so this next slide actually gives a comparison of, well, what does it really mean between LTM and narrow band IoT and how would I choose between one or the other? As I mentioned earlier, in some countries, they actually only deployed one or the other with the thought process that it really covered all the use cases, but there are some differences in which where there are where you could choose one over the other. The LTE category M network has much more higher throughput compared to narrow band IoT. If you look at the chart to the right, so you're looking at you know over 300 kilobits per second as opposed to only 30 kilobits per second for narrow band. So 10 times faster and more bandwidth. Uh, they can certainly help if you ever want to do any sort of over the air update. It can certainly help if you ever think you may have to send a relatively large file once a month or once a week or once a day. It can certainly help if you want to do some stuff on a mobile type network. So there's more bandwidth on the LTM side. It's uh, it's less latent, um, so it's a little bit quicker. Um, and you have that connected, connected mobility. So it does allow for tower handoff, to go from one to the other. So if you can look at it from sort of maybe a tracking type device or a wearable where you may be moving around in, a, in, a, in an area you want to be able to hand off from one tower to the other. All those are able on the LTEM network. The narrow band network on the hand is more for more for stationary, you know, motionless type devices. So that sensor or that um, that smart lock, whatever it could be, that's going to stay in, for the most part, stay in one place the majority of the time and not use a tremendous amount of data. Uh, narrow band IT does perform a little bit better um, in poor coverage areas. So if you're thinking of something that maybe like a uh, in a basement or underground, you get a little bit better coverage extension with the narrow band IoT, and you get a bit more of the battery savings. So if you think you want to put it in, you think you want to do a battery operated device that's going to be in one place and go for, you know, five, ten, even twelve years with one bet with one battery, you may want to look at more of a narrow band IoT type solution because it does uh, optimize power a little bit better compared to the LTM. Uh, but but if you look at the benefits, both of them offer the lower cost modules, both of them offer um, uh, the, the greater coverage, both of them offer the longer battery life. It's just a matter about the use case and where you think the throughput may be and where you want to best fit for it. You roll to the next case. Next slide for me. And then one of the things I talked about is the, the ease of configuration, right? So using these cellular based technologies, you put in a SIM card in your solution, and you're connected right then and there. Um, there's no link for the end user to have to do an additional pairing. Uh, there's no need for a self-management of the network. If you, if you think about some of the mesh networks, there's some self-management that has to occur. Um, you get ease of deployment for devices. You don't require any sort of pending. So it really kind of gives the, you get the advantages, the all the advantages of sort of your cellular based network, plus the advantages of some of those low power networks that are out there that are unlicensed and combine them into one solution, which is why we deploy both LTM and narrow band IoT networks. And if you go to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit now about where we are from a module and device standpoint. Um, so Jordan will talk about a little bit later in his presentation, but we certify our modules and devices for use on our network. At this point, we've certified well over 200 LTM devices and over 30 LTM and narrow band IoT modules. Um, so this is, showing that we are pushing the envelope ahead of time to make sure we get devices and certified that are on our network. We want to make sure that you can use a module that's certified. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a, net, a device that works properly and will perform well on our network. And so we go through a certification process 
uh, to proof for use in our network. And you can see we've already grown that ecosystem by, by quite a bit in just a short period of time. You can go ahead and roll to the next one. Um, and so I, I didn't actually mention this on where the deployment. So here at AT&T in the USA, we have deployed, we deployed, deployed the LTM network in 2017. So it's actually going into its third year of being an, a, a viable network. We were one of the first carriers in the world to deploy LTM. So we've got it, you know, it's been up and running for about three years. It's very stable now. We've got um, some of those growing pans that, that, that come with new networks already, already, uh, already solved. And so we're really growing at a pretty tremendous pace with the LTE, the LTEM network. Well, on the narrowband side, we launched narrowband IoT in April of last year. So we're just now getting a year of that network up and running. Um, we decided to launch the network because if you look globally, there actually are much more, there are more narrowband IoT deployments than there are LTM network deployments. And you see there's over close to 90 global deployments in narrowband IoT. And so we wanted to make sure that we want, we had a global footprint, right? And so because of the widespread use of narrowband IoT, we felt the need to deploy narrowband IoT in our own network here in the U.S. And so we deployed it in April last year. Um, it's growing, it's, it's growing. We're one of the few carriers actually in the world that have both networks. Um, and so with that, we went with a global strategy to try to reach out to every single carrier out there in this established roaming so we can ensure we have a global landscape for these networks. As you guys probably know or may not know, on the normal LTE side and 3G side, um, and some of those more traditional and long standing networks, we have roaming basically across the globe, a global footprint with uh, different, uh, different networks. With these two low power networks, we are starting now to kind of grow that global footprint. We've established um, uh, roaming with 11 countries for the LTM side, uh, seven countries with the narrowband side. We're gonna to get to 20 and 28 by the end of the year. Um, and we're going to really kind of push the envelope forward with with this with this um, with this this network. Some may ask, you know, what does global roaming really mean for me? Well, in, in a low power sense, especially since most of the devices are, are basically stationary. Well, it means one you can produce in one area, so you can produce it in one country, manufacture in one country, and sell it in the other country. It gives you the ability to use one SKU or one one model number, so you don't have to have a different model for every different country. Uh, you know that if you're going to sell it or if you want to use it in these different areas. I can use an AT&T AT &T SIM um, and use the same model and SKU number and put it out in all these different areas where we have roaming agreements with, which using that network. Um, and as I mentioned, we're really pushing the envelope to get more and more roaming as possible. Uh, we're trying to get to combine 48 countries by the end of the year, and we'll want to get the numbers so wherever there is a, a, a deployment of these networks, we'll have roaming in place with them, and we'll can, can continue to do that um, ongoing. For the next slide for me. And just want to uh, close here with a summary. Uh, as mentioned, we've deployed both the LTM and narrowband with global roamings. We've certified over 30 modules, uh, 35 modules actually, when I think about it. And the advantages of both, uh, lower cost hardware, longer battery life, better coverage in building, dedicated spectrum. Uh, and this one I kind of give you, um, I put in the summary here of expected field percent performance. Many people often ask, well, how does this actually work in the field? What are you actually going to see from a bandwidth standpoint? With the LTM, you get about 125 to 150 kilobits per second normally. With narrowband, you get about 15 to 25 kilobits per second normally. Um, the latency is about uh, anywhere from you know, half a second to a, a couple of seconds on. It is a it is a high latency network network, so it's not meant to mimic real time performance. It's meant for checking every half hour, hour, 15 minutes, not not necessarily for a real time type performance but it offers many more advantages that can be beneficial for your solution. And so with that, I think that's gonna, I'll push it over to Jordan to talk about some of our um, M2M and device management. Yep, thank you, Don. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna cover um, lightweight M2M and some of the advantages around that protocol as a whole. Then I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about um, how device management um, plays a role in device deployment and how lightweight M2M can, can uh, aid in a deployment of proper device management um, for, for, for a deployment. So if we'll go to the next slide, I'll jump right in. Okay, so um, lightweight M2M is kind of the, the, the successor to a, a previous protocol from the Open Mobile Alliance, and it's, it's a, a lighter weight version of OMA DM with um, 
more telemetry focused um, standards based implementations kind of built into the protocol that was previously meant for just doing firmware over the air. So why is this important? So with, with Lightweight MTM, we get a structured data format in the form of objects at the top layer. So if we look at the, the, the graphic to the right, we see that there's objects, instances of those objects, and then resources inside of those objects. This is very important when it comes to consistency between devices and platforms that are deployed in cloud or on-prem. It, it allows for easy communication and easy movement of, of that, those connections between different platforms um, and different service providers that, that may be um, providing a, a data solution to. Um, along with this structured data format that allows you to, to point these devices basically to any cloud, um, any service, you get a significant overhead advantage compared to other typical IoT or typical data, um, uh, data transmission protocols in general. So compared to HTTP, compared to MQTT, the, the overhead of Lightweight M2M is much better. And this comes from uh, Lightweight M2M being based on CoAP, which is in turn based on UDP. Um, so there's, there's maybe some disadvantage with UDP, but in a cellular network, um, we don't actually block any UDP traffic. We don't throttle that, and we've seen, um, we've seen no real loss uh, with regard to UDP versus TCP. So we think that the overhead advantage here um, is really gonna, gonna benefit a lot of these LPWA um, technologies that Don was just talking about. Um, along with the, the overhead advantages and then some of the, the structured formats that, that I was talking about, uh, you, you also get a complete security solution. It's not, this is not a protocol that, that kind of just thought about the way that data is transmitted and, and forgot about security. Um, it's also trying to optimize the way that these devices um, provide end-to-end -end encryption back to um, that solution that you're connected to. So the, the protocol uses DTLS, which is uh, basically just TLS over UDP. And it also puts kind of a priority on using a symmetric encryption, um, which in turn uh, lowers that data overhead even further. And um, with the symmetric encryption doesn't mean that we that that the protocol or the standard left out uh, the asymmetric encryption using certificates that's included as well uh, with the use of, of DTLS but um, what we're seeing is largely that the symmetric encryption is taking a hold in lightweight MCM and uh, the industry is taking full advantage of the, the data overhead um, the, the data overhead advantages in uh, Lightweight MTM versus some of these other protocols. The other thing to note here is that um, while a lot of the advantages, you know, we talk, we talk about telemetry and, and, and sending data from these devices back to the cloud and, and how, how well that is structured in Lightweight MTM and how, how much more efficient that is. Um, the other thing to note is that the, the update uh, state machines for firmware and software management are standardized in this protocol. So that means that um, you know if you're if you're building a device, um, if you're trying to implement firmware over the air, you've got you've got a way to you've got a, a template to build towards. You don't you're not out uh, trying to create something proprietary necessarily. Uh, if, you, if you create according to the state machine provided by the standard, and you connect to any server. Um, by many of the providers uh, in the industry, then that means that your devices can be managed out of the box. Um, that's particularly important for, for maybe a, you know, a smaller device developer who hasn't had a, a, a firmware over the air mechanism and is trying to, to provide that to its customers. Um, you, you don't have to worry about building uh, both sides of the equation. You have to, to worry about building your firmware mechanism but then you can follow that update state machine and you can have those devices managed by a server. Now the other thing is you may think that um, yes while we have a structured data format uh, how well defined are the objects out there what do I have to choose from 
um, there, there's quite a bit of support behind the objects. Um, I, I, I put a template for temperature over to the right, just as an example, but um, there are many uh, different entities that are uh, creating objects, um, submitting those to Open Mobile Alliance and uh, IPSO, and having those objects be a standard for these common things. AT&T has created a couple of objects, objects already, um, as well as some of the other telecoms in, in the industry. So let's go to the next slide. So why is, why is this uh, lightweight MCM protocol kind of giving, um, giving an advantage for deploying a full device management solution? Um, it's, again, it gives a, a full structure, gives a way to communicate many different things that, that you may not um, typically consider as an important part of device management and firmware management. Um, but you can send many different metrics from a device like signal strength or how the radio is communicating to the network or free memory, um, location, it, the list goes on and on. And so that's important because for a good device management solution, you have to have good campaign management and monitoring for devices. That means that you have to be able to break down these these large groups of devices that may be deployed into the field, be able to take action, be able to, to submit firmware updates to those devices um, based on uh, an array of, of different um, metrics from that device. So your campaign management and monitoring needs to be event and threshold driven. It needs to be able to decide if that if it's a proper time, proper place, proper radio conditions to be able to deliver those firmware updates. Um, again, you need, you need really complex um, grouping for these campaigns. Um, even if it's for a device uh, deployment for a single customer or a single enterprise or a device manufacturer, uh, in many cases, you'll need to split those groups of devices down into um, complex groups to, to make decisions on whether or not those devices uh, get a configuration or a firmware update. And then at the end, the other end, um, once that campaign is enrolled out, you need continuous uh, in-depth statistics on how those configurations are being applied, how the firmware is being updated. Is it, su is it successful? Why is it not successful? Um, Lightweight end to m really focuses in on, as a standard, really focuses in on the management entity or the management elements of, of the, the devices. And um, it really creates um, common themes, common elements for error management and the collection of these, these metrics from devices specific to configuration, firmware, or software uh, update rollouts. The other thing you need for a good device management solution, particularly if you're a manufacturer or if you're going to be providing a solution to um, your customers or another enterprise is, is multi-tenancy. Um, you need a way to be able to separate these devices out um, into completely different segments, not just group based on different metrics, but you need to be able to separate devices um, into different domains, different security domains, if you will, um, so that, that different users can have access to different devices. Um, so um, a different user might need access to different groups of devices, um, or that same user, maybe it's an operation manager, may need different access levels to the same groups of devices. So you could say one person might need um, uh, access to be able to deliver firmware updates, the other person might need just the access to read temperature from that device, basic access control. Um, the enterprises need to be able to do this management and operation of these devices themselves. You need to be able to provide both um, management yourself of these devices. You need to be able to give insight and control to these enterprises. And so that is the driving element behind uh, multi-tenancy and um, separation of these devices. Um, and then the last line under multi-tenancy or operations teams, um, 
they're kind of, you know, you, you want to be able to, to let these operations teams um, be middlemen between a, a manufacturer and enterprise. You may not always necessarily want that enterprise to um, have direct communication between a manufacturer, especially if you're the provider of those devices. Um, and then lastly, device diagnostics and monitoring. Even if you're not taking consistent action against these devices in a management setting, like you're not rolling out firmware, you're not installing new software, um, you need to have a consistent picture of what these devices are doing, their state, um, and, and kind of, you know, how they're performing on the network from a multitude of different perspectives. So one big one for us is we want to know what these devices are doing from a radio perspective on the network. We want to know what their signal strength is. We want to know if their signal to noise ratio is really high. So that's really important, uh, especially in the cellular industry, to be able to, to consistently get that diagnostic information so that you can take action on it. Um, and then monitoring at different levels. Um, the reason I, I, I say it this way is that uh, I, as a network provider, as a telecom, I want to monitor the radio, but that's not to say that it's not just as important to monitor maybe free memory on the application processor. So you have to be able to break these diagnostics down um, and, and be able to collect them in ways to say, this set of metrics is gonna dictate these decisions for, for managing of, the, of these devices. And this set of metrics, maybe it's for um, a different configurations. Okay, so if we jump to the next slide. So um, with that, we do have a device management platform deployed in, in our network. Um, we are uh, Lightweight M2M versions 1.0 and 1.1 compliant. Um, the way that we position our management platform currently is really to focus on uh, certification of, of, of modules, uh, radio modules. So we have requirements built around um, the radio module that, you know, lets us basically identify what the module is, what that end device is. It's, it's about inventory on our network. Um, and, and that gives us uh, some of the diagnostic capabilities um, that, that are available in the Lightweight MTM standard. So we attempt to use as many standard objects as possible. Um, we work hand in hand with, with our, our radio partners to um, certify and test these modules. And that puts us in a particularly interesting uh, place with regard to um, radio modules on the AT&T network are going to be lightweight MCM enabled. Um, so in many cases, the, the radio modules also provide that lightweight MCM client uh, as an extension out to the application processor. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's important to know that um, the network ready modules are going to support this protocol. It's built in um, and it gives us the ability to do a lot of different uh, update, um, you know, firmware update management, software update management in some cases, and then an inventory of these devices uh, so that we know what's on our network. Um, one thing I will note uh, is that we have an interoperability program, obviously, because we're, we're testing uh, these, these network ready modules. But um, if you're not a module manufacturer, that may not be as important to you. But what, what I would like to say is that that interoperability server that, that we got uh, for testing, it, it can be used as a sandbox as well. Um, we've, we stood this up and um, given access largely to everyone. Um, you know, as a sandbox, as a way to kind of push the industry forward, to give people a chance to use a server that is um, uh, built into our network. It's, uh, it's a mirror of our production system. Um, and so I, I put the link here um, for anyone who wants to, to go and um, maybe test out that platform, um, have a look inside and see kind of how easy it is to, to get connected, to get started. Um, and then if you've got a lightweight MCM client in development and you want to go and run through our test cases, 
then that's a, a really good platform to go and do that. Uh, our production platform supports photo only deployments as well as telemetry and photo deployments. Uh, one thing I'll note about the interoperability server is that it, it does not have uh, full functionality as far as um, pushing data forward out to other servers uh, for obvious reasons. We want it to be kind of a sandbox. Uh, we want it to be self-contained. So um, in the production environment, we can support um, push notifications out to other platforms. Um, it supports uh, you know, REST API call, basically um, any sort of standard method for, for reporting data forward um, is supported in production. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So what does this mean for, for device development? Um, so what I've got uh, you know, pictured on the left side of the page here is your basic device radio module chipset setup. So the, the blue board is a device. Um, it's, it's really uh, what we consider an end device. Um, it's, it's a radio module built onto a, a, a board with other components. Um, so the, the big silver case in the middle is your radio module, your LTE um, radio module, and inside that would be a chipset from one of our big chipset providers. Um, so typically, the way that these devices get built um, would be uh, you've got the cellular radio module and an app processor sitting on the same board. Um, and in a lot of cases, the uh, the, the, the stack inside these uh, elements, the radio module and the app processor, are going to be duplicated. So if you look at the traditional architecture boxes here, I've got IP stack, MQTT, HTTP. Um, I've got that listed out in, in both the radio module and the device app processor. So the way that we view this um, currently is that this this works. It, it's, it's fine. Um, it is... Uh, not the most efficient way to do things, we don't think, but this is the way it's been done for a very long time. You're using the, the module as kind of a dumb pipe to the, the, the network, um, and then controlling all of your uh, power management, um, your IP session, your um, higher layer uh, IP sessions, all of that from the device app processor. So you've got to have something um, as far as the app processor goes on the outside of the module that supports that. And that drives, in a lot of cases, the use case for that device drives what app processor is chosen. Uh, what we think is possible and what, what we've seen um, in, in the industry um, is that with the lightweight m to m client in the module, like I was talking about um, with regard to the network ready modules that we've got, uh, the device app processor on the outside actually can be slimmed down quite a bit, um, which in turn reduces uh, the cost of the bomb. Uh, and, and you don't lose any of the functionality is what, you know, what we've seen. So you get with that lightweight MCM client, you get firmware updates, you get software updates, uh, you can update the app processor on the outside of the module, um, and you, you can do all of your telemetry uh, via that lightweight MCM client that's in the module. One thing to note here is that typically the radio modules are these relatively high-powered uh, processors that sit outside of a, another um, high-powered app processor that um, manufacturers will put their applications on. We think that going to a smaller app processor on the outside of the radio module um, and using the elements inside the radio module like lightweight MTM will give uh, manufacturers uh, an advantage um, and an easier path to not only sending their data, um, but to anything else they might want to do, like the firmware updates, like the configuration changes, um, kind of giving you that entire management, device management stack uh, with the radio module. And that, that gives that module um, more value and you can reduce the cost of your hardware. With that, I think I will pass it back um, for the end of the slides. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan, Don, and Ray. All right, so we've got a couple of questions that were submitted prior to the event. 
as well as a couple in the Q&A we might be able to get to. So first question here is about bandwidth constraints. Uh, Don, are you able to talk a little bit about like IoT network bandwidth constraints, just succinctly? <laughs> Yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, the bandwidth actually really depends on network itself. So if it's starting to get the very highest, it's probably it's going to be the 5G network, which is being rolled out now. With 5G, you can get bandwidth theoretically into the gigabits per second, but you know at, at least into the couple hundred um, megabits per second. So you can get extremely high bandwidth comes with the 5G. Um, below that would be different categories of LTE. So LTE has several different categories going from um, category M at the lowest, all the way up to, you know, category four or five. And that varies for there. I would say your typical LC bandwidth is going to be between either one megabit to 10 megabits, depending on which category. And then with the ones I talked about today with the LTE category M, you're looking more around 200 to 300 kilobits per second from bandwidth. And narrow band is lower than that. Narrow band is about, about 20 kilobits. So in summary, you know, 5G is the highest at almost a gig per second, and then it goes all the way down to narrow band IoT, which is like 20 kilobits per second. Awesome. And then the next question here is actually the download speed for a 5G network. Is that that one gig per second you just talked about? Yep. Sorry, just answer that. Yeah, it's, it's one gig. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, awesome. Okay. Next question here for Ray: What is the most affordable module that is 5G compatible? Uh, the person asking the question is aiming to test out their new AI via the new AT&T 5G Plus Edge at UM uh, with their IoT devices. Okay, so that is a great question. Um, we're still early in the 5G module certification process. What we do know is the 5G modules that are coming out that we're seeing um, are gonna be based on the Qualcomm chipset, the SDX55. And we should have a sub six, as well as a sub six and millimeter wave module options coming out. We're looking towards the fourth quarter of 2020 for availability. So we think towards the fourth quarter, they should start becoming available um, for testing and um, production. Right now, the indications we have are that pricing will be north of $200. So there's going to be some time before these modules are out in the marketplace in quantities and there's enough competition to drive that pricing down within um, something we look for more in the production type environment. And also these new modules will require a complete certification process. So, you know, in terms of walking through this and what your the decisions you need to make in these areas, that's where, you know, the combination of Arrows engineers and the AT&T engineers can help guide the timing and which module options are best for your builds. Awesome, thank you, Ray. All right, next question here for Don. Uh, you had that really cool slide with the world map. Question here is, when will new IoT cellular technologies be available worldwide, like not just in some countries? Yeah, that's a, that was a really good question. So it um, kind of goes sort of back to the technology. Some of the more mature ones like LTE is, effect, is effectively available worldwide. So you can you go just about anywhere with it. Um, with like, say the other end, the 5G, which is still coming out now, it really is going to be probably a couple years, if not three or four years before it's truly worldwide. And I'll say with the ones today I spoke about with the LTE category M and with the narrow band LTE, um, there's a growing, I think, you know, as a, again, right now it's available in most of, I guess, the um, high GDP countries. So you think about a lot of ones in, in the Americas and Europe. Uh, and even Asia are available now. I think over the next year or so, so maybe like 2021, you'll see a much more wider spread of it. Uh, it's available right now in about 100 countries. So once we get to the 250, 300, you know, in 2021, I think it'll be the, the biggest widespread use of the networks. Cool. All right, next question for Jordan. What do you recommend for an entrepreneur in the IoT space that's just starting out? Do you have any words of advice? 
Uh, yeah, I, I do. Um, so from, from a cellular perspective, I would say, um, you know, one thing to, to really focus on here is uh, certification requirements. No matter um, where you go, there will be um, there will be some certification requirements. Uh, so, you know, we have really good resources around what it takes to, to certify an end device. Um, uh, I think, you know, Don had some, some of those links in his slides to, to our, our web pages that talk about devices and devices that are out there. Uh, I think that, you know, knowing that, um, knowing that information ahead of time, knowing what process you've got to go through, uh, to get to the point that you're a certified device is is crucial. It will save you um, lots of time, and in some cases, you know, when you're testing with a lab, you're doing some some of the more complex RF testing. Uh, it'll save you a lot of money as well. Um, second thing I would say is, uh, like Ray was talking about, utilize utilize the engineers that are around you. Utilize the the aero engineers if you don't have RF engineers on staff. Um, don't necessarily think that it's it's easy to do RF. Uh, in a lot of cases, we see that um, antenna design can can ruin a certification for a device and send somebody back to the drawing board. So, if you're not comfortable or if you don't have a team that does that uh, RF engineering already, um, make sure that you utilize uh, you know a well-known group um, or a well-known entity that's done it before and can get you through that certification. Um, you know, right off the bat. And then uh, last thing, last thing I'll say, um, you know, if you're going to design something in the LPWA space uh, and, and you're not familiar with um, kind, of, kind of that really low power constrained um, you know, device space, um, make sure that you, 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 you know, you spend extra time on optimizing your software. Um, we have seen uh, in a lot of cases that LTM and Aeroband, while they're great technologies and they do they do great for what they're designed for, they can throw some developers for a loop when it comes to error management and just knowing um, exactly how slow it's going to be and how um, kind of the consistency of the the latency that you're going to get on the network. So uh, I would say pay extra attention to that, whether it's a stationary device or a mobile device. Awesome. Thank you so much. It looks like Don has actually been answering some of the questions in the Q&A already. So we'll just uh, go ahead and move on to the next slide really quick. So just to wrap up, I quickly want to tell everyone about the Aero Certification Program. This is Indiegogo's initiative with Aero and at and Business to help tech entrepreneurs navigate prototype designing, manufacturing challenges, supply chain management, and much more. Um, the program is 100% free and it offers benefits like engineering design reviews, rebates on components from aero.com, and access to AT&T business IoT data plans and SIM cards at no cost, just to help you bring your IoT ideas to life. Uh, next slide. So yeah, to learn more and join the program, again, no cost, um, just here to help and provide you with the resources you might need, just go to enterprise.indiegogo.com slash arrow. I just wanna say thank you again so much for our speakers from at and Business today, Ray Burke, Don Johnson, and Jordan Alexander. This has been super informative. Thank you guys. Um, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar today. We will see you next time. Uh, have a great day, everyone.